And now, and now we're here for the main event. So, Latoya M. Hobbs is an artist, wife, and mother of two from Little Rock, Arkansas, who is currently living and working in Baltimore, Maryland. She has received a bachelor's in painting from the University of Arkansas in Little Rock, an MFA in printmaking from Purdue University. Her work deals with figurative imagery that addresses the ideas of beauty, cultural identity, and womanhood as they relate to women in the African diaspora. Her exhibition records includes numerous national and international venues, as well as private and public collections. Hobbs is also a professor at the Maryland Institute College of Art and a co-founding member of Black Women of Print, a collective whose vision is to make visible the narratives and works of black women printmakers, past, present, and future. Creative Mornings Baltimore, please welcome Latoya M. Hobbs to the Creative Morning stage. Good, good, is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd first like to start by thanking Creative Mornings for inviting me to be here today, particularly um, Kira and Mario, who have been my contacts throughout this process. Um, I don't want to go through my whole introduction, but a couple of things. Again, my name is Latoya M. Hobbs. I'm originally from Little Rock, Arkansas, born and raised. Um, I moved to Baltimore in 2013 to take a teaching position at Maryland Institute College of Art. Um, whenever I start my talks and introductions, I always like to start with the image of my family, as you can see on the screen, just because they are so important to my life and a lot of uh, the work that I'm making now is about my family. Um, and so my husband is there. He, unfortunately, he could not be here today. He's out of town. But his name is Ariston Jacks, another amazing artist. Um, and my two sons, Ade and Theo, who are also here today. You guys want to wave? No? <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right, um, so before I kind of talk about spirituality and how it relates to my practice, I do just want to give a brief overview of the type of work that I do for those who may not already be familiar um, with my work. So in terms of my art practice, I describe myself as a painter and a printmaker. Um, I'm really interested in producing mixed media works that seamlessly marry elements of both of those practices together. So I do a lot of mixed media works that um, kind of, I'm doing everything on the same surface. So I'm collaging, I'm carving, painting. Um, I really like the idea of taking these very separate processes and putting them together in a really seamless way where the viewer really kind of has to investigate the work to decide what's happening on the surface. Um, so this image here is titled Portrait of a Mother which is a self-portrait. Um, I've been doing a lot of self-portraits um, with my practice lately. Um, and it's a part of a larger body of work titled Salt of the Earth, which I'll kind of talk about in detail a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but just kind of looking at the materials of this piece, uh, the skin is painted with like oil paint, how you would traditionally do painting. Um, the dress, you can see there's texture there. So I carved that part like I would normally do um, like a woodcut, and then other parts are kind of stenciled and collaged. Um, and so since I'm talking about printmaking, for those of you who may not be familiar with that process, so this, this is the educator in me. Um, so printmaking is a process where you start with a matrix of some kind. So that could be a wood block in my case, or a litho stone, or a piece of copper. So that becomes like the, the art tool. So you develop the image on there, and then you use that to produce a series of images that are the same, or we also call that an addition. So that's kind of where my grounding is in terms of my printmaking practice. But um, I've really been kind of investigating that and thinking about the matrix as the art object in, it, in and of itself. Um, this is a more recent work called Targeted Focus. Um, You'll see that in my portraiture work, I do a lot of women, uh, particularly women that I know. Um, I, it's, that seems to be um, really important to me, um, and I'm able to kind of connect with the subject um, in a stronger way. Um, I do, you know, people that I don't know sometimes, but majority, I would say 90% of the images that you see are people that I actually know or have some type of relationship with. Um, so in this um, piece, I have my bonus daughter, Erin who has the ponytail, and then I have my niece, Anaya. Um, and so, you know, a lot of times the titles or other elements such as the patterns and symbols that I use in my work, they're reflective either of the subject that I'm exploring or the particular people that I am featuring in the work. Um, and again, here that you can see there's a lot of different processes. You can see the carving of the flesh, which is indicative of my printmaking practice. Um, you can see the clothing. I kind of... Um, pretend like I am dressing these people or dressing the models. So I you know, hand print a lot of these textiles that you see in my work to create um, kind of textiles to dress the figures. 
And then the last piece I'm going to talk about in terms of the overview of my practice is a work that I completed last year titled Carving Out Time. Um, so earlier I talked about the idea of using the print matrix as the art object. So normally with printmaking, once you carve the block and you make your addition, normally the block is just something that you tuck away and store away that's not going to be used anymore. Um, but I personally find so much beauty in the surface of the matrix. I'm really attracted to texture. I'm kind of the person in museums like I'm always is about to touch the work just because <laughs> I'm really into how things feel. And so I just kind of fell in love with the blocks. And so sometimes I would carve a block and then make an addition, but I would just be so much in love, you know, with the block than I was the actual prints. And so that kind of you know, caused me to question, well, why can't the matrix be the artwork in and of itself? So that was the goal for this piece. Um, as I mentioned, it's called Carving Out Time. It is a monumental wood carving that takes you through a day in my life as a mother and practicing artist. Um, the work is, the dimensions are, it's eight feet tall and about 60 feet wide. So I, I put this slide first with my image there so you can kind of get a context um, of the scale. So I consider it as a work, one work in five parts, kind of like how you think of a play, like a play has different acts. Um, so this work kind of gives you the, these separate phases of my day. Um, so this work is like very layered and I could talk about just this work for like two hours, but we only have 20 minutes. So I'm just going to kind of go through each of the scenes and list the titles of the work. Um, so this first scene or first phase of the day is titled morning. Um, you can kind of see a detail shot there. So I literally like carved all of these lines into the surface um, of the wood block. Uh, the next phase of the day is titled Homeschool and Housework, kind of acknowledging my role as an educator in my household. I homeschool my children in addition to um, educating people at MICA. Uh, this next scene is <laughs> this next scene is titled Dinner Time. <laughs> Um, kind of representing like the apex of the day and you know all the family members are present during this time. This is titled Bedtime for the Boys. And then we finally end the day with me being able to transition from my role as a mother into, into my role as an artist. Um, just a tidbit, I saw that MAP is one of the sponsors for, here, for this, so I actually produced this work in MAP. I had to rent a separate studio just because it was so large. I normally work in my home basement, but for this work I had to rent a separate space, and so I was able to secure a studio at MAP to create this work. Um, so this was uh, on display in an exhibition titled All Due Respect at the Baltimore Museum of Art. The, that exhibit closed in April, I believe. Um, and I'm really happy to say that this is now part of the permanent collection at the Baltimore Museum of Art. <laughs> So I'm not sure when it will be back on display, but once I know, I will definitely let you guys know. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about spirituality and how it plays a part um, in my, my work. And I will say, you're just kind of segueing into this section, I, I would say that my faith and my spirituality is uh, just plays a big part in my life in general, and I think, you know, when we create work authentically, parts of our life just automatically seep into our work. Um, so these works that I'm about to show you, I call them early works because they were created around like 2008 to 2012. So kind of, I would say the really, you know, the beginnings of my practice as an artist. So um, these were kind of, you know, er undergrad works and kind of early graduate school works where I was just really trying to like understand technically how to paint and technically how um, to make prints and to do woodcuts. Um, but the common theme through all this works is that they all have halos and lights. So that was, um, halos are kind of a motif that I started developing, one, as a way to um, express uh, my faith and my spirituality, but it also came about as a result of a lot of the art history classes that I was taking at the time. Um, unfortunately, with my undergrad experience, there was not a lot of diverse, diversity in, types of, in terms of the types of courses that were offered. So I kind of, you know, jokingly describe my art history experience as looking at white people with halos. <laughs> so I was like, so many people with halos. And so, um, you know, that kind of really inspired me to kind of go on this own, my own journey of creating images of people in my community that reflected me, that reflected um, my culture. But the halo kind of came about as to show um, our righteousness and the admiration that I have um, for, you know, my family members, church members, people in my community. Um, and so this piece is titled Clarice. Um, Clarice is a really good friend of mine. We actually used to do liturgical dance together um, in church. 
Um, and so this kind of marks a significant part of my development as well, because um, I started my undergraduate degree as a painting major, but I struggled a lot. <laughs> um, it took me a long time to really get it together in terms of like learning how to paint. Um, and so I would describe this as like my first successful painting. Um, and so in addition to kind of this halo motif with these uh, sequential works that you'll see, there's also this really strong emphasis on light. Um, from a technical standpoint, you know, this idea of chiaroscuro or having a directional light source is really important to creating like a three-dimensionality um, within your figures. But for me, it also kind of represents like the spirit or like the spirit of God or like the essence of the person themselves. So this next piece, um, I would consider this like one of my first really successful woodcuts um, uh, done in 2009, which is the time that I really kind of got serious about printmaking. Um, I didn't really delve into printmaking seriously until like the end. Like I actually graduated undergrad in 2009, and so that, you know, those last two semesters, I really, you know, kind of um, fell in love with printmaking and wanted to explore that even more. And so that kind of carried over to me wanting to study that for my MFA. But this piece is titled Peace and Humility. Um, it's another self-portrait. Um, and so for me, like, if I can't find a model, I just, like, use myself. <laughs> uh, use myself as a subject in, in the works. And so that's an easy way for me to kind of talk about the ideas. I feel like I can talk about them through my life um, easier. Um, and so the title Peace and Humility kind of reflects the posture um, that I am embodying in this work. So, you know, just kind of this really calm and somber look on my face and then, you know, the head is slightly bowed to kind of represent like humility or kind of submission or a kind of even, even this like contemplative um, state. And you can see again, there's another halo. Um, and so some of the halos kind of become stylized or more exaggerated um, as you'll see in some of these other images. Uh, so this next work is titled Divine, another early uh, painting of mine. With well, this work in particular, I was really exploring color, which I don't really use a lot of color in my work now. I'm kind of starting to get back into that. Um, you know, with my printmaking background, I just love black and white so much. I think it's so powerful. Um, but during this time, I was exploring color a lot. So you can see these, there's this vibrant red and this vibrant um, yellow, um, the, the halo behind her head, you can kind of also, you know, can double as the sun. Um, but I really wanted those strong colors to be reflected in, uh, to the model's skin. This is another uh, friend that I knew from church at the time named Angelica. Um, and this is a, a portrait of the same model. So this kind of marks a transition um, into my graduate school work. Um, one thing that is significant, um, you can see that there is a start to be an increase in scale. Um, a lot of my works I consider large scale, at least with my printmaking practice, they're large for prints. Normally with printmaking work, you kind of think, you know, small scale. Um, but yeah, I, I like working large and torturing myself um, <laughs> in that way. Um, you, this also kind of marks the time where I start to incorporate patterns in my work. Um, I take patterns, the inspiration from a lot of different places, but majority of the patterns I use in my work are um, created by like Adinkra symbols. Um, if you're not familiar with Adinkra symbols, they're most commonly associated with West African culture. Um, but they have a lot of different meanings. And so a lot of, when I was starting the research of those, a lot of those different meanings of the symbols kind of resonated um, with the things that I was trying to portray in my work. And then this is uh, another image titled Inner Glow. Again, kind of this emphasis on light. Um, this is significant because I tried a different approach to my carving. So you can see um, with some of the other woodcuts that were more linear in nature, um, but this is kind of a, a stippling approach. Um, and so the stippling approach kind of reminded me of like stars or the galaxy or kind of constellations, which for me is another um, like interpretation of like the spirit realm. Okay, so now I'm gonna kind of swing back to uh, more of my current works. As I mentioned, I've been working through this series titled Star Salt of the Earth. Um, I call it an extended series because I'm not really sure how or when it's going to end. Um, whenever I have works that I feel fit in that vein, I just kind of continue to work on them. Um, but that phrase, salt of the earth, is inspired by the um, biblical scripture, Matthew 5.13. It's on the screen there. Um, so I won't read it verbatim, but in an essence, in, in terms of the context of my work, I am personifying women as salt. And the characteristic of salt that I'm thinking about is that of a preserver. So really thinking about how women, we preserve our families and our cultures and our community. 
Um, there's a lot of underlying themes within this series. So um, obviously it's inspired by biblical scripture. So you have another like layer of spirituality. Um, but I've really been thinking about this idea of the matriarch. Um, this idea of like self-care, right? We talked about, the scripture talked about salt and what happens when it's cast out. Hey, shh, shh. getting loud, thank you. Uh, what happens when the salt is cast out. And so I kind of think about that in terms of how we personify like the strong black woman motif. Um, I feel like as women in general, we do so much to preserve our families that we're constantly pouring out to other people. But I feel like at the same time, you have to make sure that you're preserving yourself so that you're not the salt that becomes cast out, right? Um, this series has also been an opportunity for me to talk about uh, my role as a mother. And actually the idea for Salt of the Earth came a lot earlier, like way before I actually started making the work for it. Um, but I really didn't understand what that meant to me until I became a mother. Um, so this piece is titled Birth of a Mother. Um, and I, I really enjoy this title because, you know, it shows me um, during my first pregnancy with Ade, gentleman in the black shirt. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so I'm about to give birth to him, but at the same time, I'm being birthed into this role of becoming a mother. Um, and so gray dominates this palette for a couple of reasons. Just, I just love gray. It's like my favorite neutral color. Um, but during this time in my life, I also had a lot of gray areas or just kind of thinking about, you know, this big mental and emotional and physical shift into becoming a mother. Um, and I had, a, you know, a question to myself a lot, and there were a lot of fears that arose that I didn't know I had. Um, you know, just obviously the fear of like, am I going to be a good mother? But um, I really questioned my capability as an artist in my art practice. Like, you know, what people take me seriously as an artist now that I'm a mother. Um, I purposely didn't make any work about being a mom just because, I, you know, um, we hear so many stories of women artists who, you know, once they got pregnant, their gallery dropped them or um, they weren't able to like secure shows. So, so I kind of had those fears. And also during this time, I had just moved. I was a year into um, moving here and then a year into my teaching position at MICA. So I was like, oh, am I going to be able to keep my job? Um, you know, so I had so many of these questions. And I really had to question where those fears came from. And I, I believe it was kind of just this internalization of how we view women in society. Um, and so to confront that, I just, you know, said this is who I am. It's a big part of my life. I'm going to make work about that. And I feel like that's so important because it resonates with so many people. Um, what else do I want to say about this work? I think I'll go to the next one. Um, so I talked about the idea of a matriarch. And so in me kind of being ushered into this role of being a mother, it's caused me to think a lot about the other women in my family, um, such as my mother <clears throat> and my grandmother. Um, all of the cousins that I grew up with now were all mothers ourselves. And so this idea of the matriarch and lineage and what has been passed down to me from my four mothers, and in return, what I'm passing down to my children. Um, so this work is titled, How Janetta Taught Us to Pray. Um, it's a tribute to my grandmother. Her name was Janetta. And kind of this legacy of um, prayer that she established in my family. Um, I will say, that just in terms of my upbringing, I did grow up in church in the South. <clears throat> Um, and so that's a, you know, a really big part of my life and a part of, you know, uh, my practice. Um, but this work, you, there's this a portrait of my mother in this kind of position of prayer. Um, and so I remember like a few years back, I was talking to my mom um, about when I used to go stay with my grandmother in the summers, all of my cousins. And so I have this really vivid memory of her waking us up at like, three o'clock in the morning. Um, and she, she would make us go in the living room. We had to stand in a line and we had to like hold the Bible. We had to say a verse and then we like had to say a prayer. Um, and I just was like, what is going on? Um, but I told my mom that story and she said, yeah, she used to make us do the same thing when we were little. And so <laughs> it just, it just kind of made me think about again, what is passed down from generation to generation. Um, and so I don't make my children wake up at like three in the morning to pray, but we do pray. <laughs> We do pray before, you know, they go to bed at night. So that's kind of like a, a, a practice of ours. And then sometimes they even remind me, you know, mom, we didn't say the prayer yet, you know. So um, just kind of thinking about, again, the things I want to instill in them. So there is a sister piece to this work. Um, and again, the title, How Janetta Taught Us to Pray. This time, it's a portrait of me. Um, just kind of, you know, thinking about the intergenerationality of these pieces. Um, again, you know. 
in this position of prayer also can be, you know, interpreted as like this um, position of like submission. Um, and then just in terms of like the materials, I do have like kind of a detailed image. Um, so this work is on a wood panel. And so again, I like that because I can carve into um, the surface and kind of do everything. So the clothing that I'm wearing is collage, like paper that I've hand printed. Um, the flesh is carved and then the background is kind of painted. And then you can kind of see both of these works together. So there are some very deliberate decisions that I made about the work, um, specifically the lighting. I wanted you know, us to kind of feel like we could be in the same space together even though we're on separate panels. So the lighting is coming from the same direction um, <clears throat> we have different garments, but they're made out of the same pattern, um, just to kind of show our connection as mother and daughter. And also, um, the pattern and the background is very dark. Um, it's kind of, I don't know if you can, you can kind of see it here. Yeah, so I did this kind of like deep red um, pattern in the background. Um, and then it's very dark, just because I wanted it to kind of represent that time of day that my grandmother, you know, would kind of wake us up in the middle of the night to pray. <laughs> and there's both of those works again. And then the last work that I'm going to end on is this work titled Stargazer. Um, and so I really been thinking a lot about like legacy um, and tradition as I mentioned you know thinking about what has been passed on to me good and bad and then what I want to pass on <laughs> um, to my children not just in terms of their like spirituality but just is as their life in their lives in general um, so as, as I mentioned this piece is called Stargazer um, and I looked up the I don't know, when I saw this image, that my, my husband supplied this image of my son, Theo, um, when I saw the image from the title Stargazer automatically came up just because of, you know, the, um, his gaze is elevated, almost like he's looking up at the sky or kind of looking up at the stars. But there were lots of definitions for the term stargazer. But one um, thing that stood out to me was daydreamer or somebody who gazes at the stars. Um, so this work is kind of... Um, aspirational in terms of the things that I hope for my children. Um, yeah, and again, this upward gaze, looking at this kind of ominous light source can symbolize so many things. You can like literally looking up at the stars or it can symbolize like expectation. It can symbolize hope. It can you know, symbolize so many different things. Um, so I tend to do more women in my work, but I'm kind of shifting that a little bit, but starting with the people in my family. So I do plan to do um, a portrait of Ade and also a portrait of my husband in the same style with this kind of upward gaze. Um, yeah, and so just ending with this piece, you know, I, I would say the, um, I guess the, the things that I would leave with you are hope and wonder. Um, so, you know, hopefully by you finding a way to tap into your own spirituality and realizing what that is for you and how that plays into your everyday life, it can kind of um, fuel your sense of creativity and the work that you do. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Latoya. This is, it's such a treat to have you here with us and just get a little bit more nuance of your work. And I know it's an abbreviated talk, but still I feel like we've learned so much. So <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, we want to open it up for Q&A. So if you have a question, we'd love to, to get to it. Um, we are committed to getting you out of here by 10, though, too. So just just so you know. <laughs> but I can, yeah, I can kick off the Q&A when you, when you all are thinking about it. Um, so I want to talk more about uh, carving out time, okay. like, which is just such a tremendous body of work. I, I hope that you all did get a chance to see it at the BMA. Um, but I'm excited that it was purchased. So mm -hmm. hopefully we can see it again soon. I understand that you made prints from that too. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, um, just thinking about printmaking in a traditional sense, but then how I am articulating it as um, these matrices as more of, of paintings. So when I initially was going to do this work, I was just gonna make it a, a really huge mixed media piece. Um, so I was gonna do like color and collaging and things, um, but, and I've told this story, uh, you know, a couple other times when I talk about this work, um, but my husband, 
Again, he's also an artist. Um, he was just like, it doesn't make sense for you to do all this carving and not make prints of the work. But I was like, well, I don't want it to be a print. Uh, it's just, you know, I'm presenting these pieces as paintings. He's like, I don't tell you what to do in your work, <laughs> but this time <laughs> you need to print, you know, print these pieces. Um, and so, you know, we kind of brainstormed how that would happen. And for me, it ended up being a lot more work because um, a lot of my pieces like this one per se, if I know ahead of time that I'm gonna be collaging, I don't carve that surface because it's, be, it's gonna be covered up anyway. Um, and so you can't really do that with a piece that you're going to print because whatever you don't carve is gonna be black. That space is not gonna be activated. So when thinking about this, I was like, okay, well I'm not collaging anything because I'm gonna have to print. So I had to like really think about like carving and articulating every aspect um, of the work so that when it's printed, the prints are their own separate work. So the prints can exist in the world um, as they're intended to be. And then, you know, if I wanted to, I could kind of go back and do other things. Um, with the blocks, but as I was getting into the carving process, which I really love, that's kind of the thing that I am uh, most excited about. I do consider myself a painter and I do still paint, but I feel like the carving is something that's really specific to me. Um, but in the process of getting involved in the carving, I just was like, this is just powerful on its own. It doesn't really need um, anything else. Um, so I do have uh, an addition of two and an artist proof that I'm gonna keep for myself. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like two works in one. <laughs> yeah. My son said he had a question. You have a question, Adi? Yeah, do you have a question? You got to use the microphone so people can hear you. Yeah, mommy. <laughs> yes? What's the first artwork that you did, that you did, that the you did? The first artwork, ooh. Hmm, that's really hard. Um, Cause I think, you know, we have levels of our existence as artists. So I was like a little kid artist. And then I was like an artist in junior high school. And then I was like a professional artist. So um, I would say in terms of like a professional artist, I really can't tell you the first, but there's lots of them. And there's lots of works that I don't show anybody because I'm just like, nobody can ever see this. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I will say, I guess one of um, the first, I think, works that I really enjoyed that was significant is the piece that's in your room, the angel piece. Yeah, so I was experimenting with a lot of different things, and I don't have any other work that's like that. It's like a soft sculpture um, piece of an angel, or it's like a Nike, which means like victory. So, yeah. Thank you for your question. <laughs> uh, first, thank you so much for that presentation. That was amazing. Um, within sort of like how you show up in all these different facets of, of your life, right? Being a mother, um, uh, being a wife, being a teacher, um, all these transactions happen. And, and when we look at your work, um, even just the way you go about making your work is so transformative. And I want to know, um, besides your, your, your output as an artist, in what other ways do you sort of, um, take those pieces of yourself and your life that can sort of show up as transactional and make them transformative. Can you repeat the last part? Sorry. In what ways, so in what ways do you take like those pieces of yourself and your life that can sort of become so transactional, like becoming, like, like being a mother, being a wife, being a teacher, and how do you um, make those transformative? Um, I think that's, I think we're all in the process of, of doing that. Um, and I think because I do hold so many um, hats, or, you know, have so many roles, for me, the transformative part is making those, all those things harmonize with each other. <laughs> um, you know, you, we hear a lot of people kind of talk about, at least they ask women who, you know, are really busy or professionals, like, how do you find balance? Um, I think balance is like unrealistic. I would rather have harmony to have all these different things that I do be in harmony. Um, with each other and then if something is not in harmony, that thing probably has to go or we have to figure out a way um, to make all those things work. So I don't really know if that adds, answers your question um, about it being kind of um, transactional, but 
um, it's, it's finding a way to make all of the pieces fit together and have harmony between um, all those different things. And also just kind of being really honest and being really introspective um, about my practice, the goals, the things that I want, um, the things that I enjoy. And again, kind of the, going back to this idea of um, like salt of the earth, like how do I make sure that I am not kind of um, over, over exerting myself and kind of being cast out. Um, so just in a season of as my practice is starting to expand and to grow, um, being really intentional and being really specific about the things that I do and just kind of learning that I don't have to do everything. <laughs> like it's okay to say no sometimes. And so, you know, even if it's kind of a great opportunity, it may not be the best thing to do, you know, at the time. So, yeah, thank you. All the way in the back. Hey, Miss, uh, hey, Miss Hobbs. Hey. Um, so I am a print maker as well. Um, what is it like getting into rhythm of like your, your mark making? Are you listening to music or are you just like free flowing and um, um, just like making marks? Um, well, in terms of like, I guess the carving itself, um, I had to learn not to separate how I think about the different processes. As I, I talked about, I'm a painter as well. So I don't think about like developing my painting any different than I do thinking about, you know, developing a, a, a print or a wood carving. Um, so in terms of like the image formation, or at least this idea of kind of like sculpting the figures, because, you know, having things look and feel three dimensional is really important to me. So, you know, how I draw an image, I'm thinking about that the same way as carving. Um, so in terms of like some, you know, technical terms like contour, cross contour, um, value, I don't think about those things any differently, whether I'm doing a painting or whether I'm doing a drawing or whether I'm doing um, a woodcut. Um, in terms of like my studio environment, I am an introvert. Um, I don't like people around when I'm working. I don't like any visitors, um, which my husband is the opposite. Like he like he can like just draw a whole thing and have a conversation. I am not that way. Um, and so he was like coming in the studio. I'm like, what are you doing <laughs> in here? Uh, so I really like to work alone. Um, some uh, things that I do kind of do to tap in. Um, one, I'm just kind of already like really focused. And so once I'm in the studio, I, I'm in there. Um, but I like to listen to music. It's a really big part um, of my practice in my work environment. I also like scented candles. That's kind of like a self-care, um, a small self-care thing uh, for me. But in terms of just the, like the formation and then the carving, um, I, don't, I don't think about them as separate things, which really helped me um, earlier in my practice too. I mentioned that I used to struggle with painting a lot. And that was more just of a mental block because I had told myself that painting is hard. Um, but I remember um, when I was you know, taking painting, I was struggling, but I was in a drawing class working with pastels and you know that was kind of my jam. I was like, okay, yes, I can do these pastels. But then my painting teacher, you know, he happened to walk in. He was like, Latoya, if you can just do this, but with paint, then you got it. And I was like, oh. Okay, so I just, I didn't think about the oil paint as being any different than the pastel. So I'm using like however I can make connections of how to think about things in the same way that just kind of helps me um, take some of the intimidation out of like the actual technical aspects of making the work. And my second question is how long does it take you to finish like the large work? Are you working on, um, on, on separate blocks at a time or are you working on multiple blocks at a time? Um, well, with carving out time, that was like a beast in and of itself. So um, I started that work in the pandemic, um, like the fall of 2020, and then I finished in like the late spring of 2021 um, before it was in going to the museum. Um, and so, you know, just it's a very labor intensive process. So that I just had, I didn't focus on anything else but that work. Um, and it, it was also helpful that I was on sabbatical. So that's kind of a special instance, it's instance in and of itself. But normally when I'm working, I like to have multiple pieces at a time. Um, so I, I, earlier in the year, I finished this series. Um, of portraits of the members of Black Women of Print. 
And so with those pieces, there were like seven pieces. So I was working on all those at the same time. Um, I like, I do kind of like an assembly style model. So um, like I work on wood panels. So I'll sand all the panels at once. Then I'll paint all the panels black at once. I'll do all the drawings. Then I'll do all the collaging. Then I'll do all the carving. So it kind of helps me to be able to bounce back and forth between um, one image to the next. That way, if I get st stuck on something, there's always something else in progress um, that I can go to. And I found that that has been really helpful in kind of um, increasing my productivity. You got to go to the back? OK, go ahead. Uh, Lady Hobbs, what's going on? Hey. Hey, I uh, just had a question for you. Uh, maybe a broad, heavy question. Um, so in our generation today, in society, what we got going on, what makes you so fly, so dope? You said what now? What makes you so dope? What makes me so cool? Yeah. I think that I just show up as myself, honestly. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, we hear people, you know, say these things like there's only one you, you know, you know, um, be yourself. But I think that is the most authentic way to be because you are the only you that's out there. Um, and yeah, I don't. I don't know. I think it's just kind of me being um, comfortable in my skin, acknowledging uh, who I am as a person, um, acknowledging who I am in God's sight and as a child of God and as a woman. Um, I think just showing up as your authentic self and not being apologetic about who you are, I think, is really important. I think that's what makes people fly, in my opinion. We have our last question way back here. Hello, I'm back here with my six-month-old. Uh, first, it is not lost on me that uh, carving out time is an intricate, time-intensive piece because the labor of finding time as a parent is real. Um, and secondly, Angela Garbs talks about mothering as social change, where mothering is a verb available to all of us, uh, not just the biology of giving birth. So. With that lens of mothering, how do you connect that to the practice of art making? And how do you connect that to the practice of spirituality? Yeah, so earlier I talked about this idea of um, the matriarch. And so for me, it's kind of a questioning of that. And so I kind of think about this term of the modern matriarch. And kind of to the point that you said, I feel like you don't have to have necessarily birthed um, natural children uh, to be considered a matriarch. I feel like um, we birth ideas, we birth communities. Um, this is a birthing in and of, of itself, bringing people together um, for a common goal and a common purpose. So for me, you can operate in a matriarch in a lots of different ways other than like um, the more traditional sense. Um, in terms of my personal life, I feel like um, mothering for me is a, like a very spiritual act in and of itself. Um, just because of the intimacy that you have to develop um, with the people in your in your household and in, in your community, um, yeah. I don't know if I answered that <laughs> that correctly, but I, I do feel like that um, this idea of a matriarch is kind of more broad, and that just because you haven't necessarily birthed um, a natural child or a child from your physical being, that doesn't mean you don't operate as a matriarch. And I've also had other women to pour into my life outside of the women in my family. So I've had a lot of like what I call spiritual mothers um, in the church, but also just in my life. I feel like um, I, I'm constantly gleaning from the women in my community, which is why I do so many portraits of, of people. I'm just kind of highlighting their stories. Um, I'm really not, you know, well, I won't say that I'm not into doing celebrities because I'll definitely take commissions and stuff, but I, I do really enjoy working with people that I can call and talk to. Um, I'm thinking about them as I, as I work, so that for me is, while I'm working on a portrait of somebody, it's almost kind of like a prayer of sorts because I'm thinking about them, I'm sending good vibes their way, I'm thinking about you know the last conversation that we had, um, you know if they told something that they were going through, I'm kind of thinking about them and kind of praying for them on, on their behalf. So it's a really kind of personal process for me as well. So actually, one very last question. How do people stay in touch with your work? How do people follow sure. you, support you? I'll go to this last screen. So um, my IG is Latoya Hobbs. So I, I will just give this disclaimer that I have two IG accounts. 
primarily because earlier in the year my account got hacked, and so I just was like, I'm never gonna get it back, let me start another one. And as soon as I started another one, I was able to get the other account back. Um, so you may see like two accounts, they're both like real, um, but my primary account is at Latoya Hobbs. Um, my website is latoyamhobbs.com where you can see like current images that I have or, or older images. And then if you're interested in um, watching the video about carving out time, my husband, um, documented me throughout the process and so he produced um, this video kind of giving you insight look behind like the actual creation of the work and me kind of talking about um, the inspiration of the work more in depth so you can see that video at Latoya M. Hobbs Studio on YouTube. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for listening.